In this lecture, we're going to return to the theme of evaluation and look at it from two different perspectives. To set the stage for what we're going to do, let's recall the primary goal of evaluation. We have argued that the eval-apply cycle is the central element of a language. It is the component that enables us to program in a high-level language. That eval-apply cycle lets us write programs in an abstract way, since it will unwind those abstractions at evaluation time, reducing them to a set of primitive operations on primitive data objects. This then connects the descriptions we write at an abstract level to the actual machine operations for determining meanings of expression. This key idea means that the evaluator is the component that defines our language for us. It encapsulates the rules for determining the meaning of an abstract expression in terms of more primitive operations, and thus it spells out the semantics of our language. Of particular importance here is the fact that describing the process of evaluation is exactly that, a description of a process. This means that we can capture that description in a procedure, and thus the evaluator is just another program. The relevance of this observation is that we can explore variations on languages by simply modifying the evaluator. Thus, in this lecture, we're going to build on this idea under two different perspectives. First, from the perspective of a language designer, that is, how can we take advantage of the fact the evaluator is just a program to change the manner in which the language evolves? And then secondly, from the perspective of a theorist, that is, how can we use the fact that the evaluator is a program to answer fundamental questions about what is computer? Let's start by thinking like a designer. If we think about what we have seen with eval and apply, we know that the basic cycle is, given an expression and an environment in which the, to interpret the symbols of the expression, let's unwind the expression into an evaluation of a simpler expression with respect to an extended environment, and keep doing that until we can return a value. The problem is that this may involve a lot of wasted computation. An alternative is to try and analyze the expression as much as possible before interpret. This means that we could try to extract as much information as possible about the expression without actually looking up values of elements within the expression. This static analysis stage would attempt to convert the expression to a more efficient form so that when evaluated with respect to some environment, it would lead to better computational performance. So why would we want to do this? Well, a key reason is that this can enable us to avoid repeated, unnecessary work. We'll see an example of this shortly. The second reason is that by statically analyzing an expression, we may be able to catch a lot of errors. If you think about it, you'll realize that under the standard scheme, we don't catch bugs until evaluation or execution time, and this can be a pain. Often it would be better if we could catch typos or wrong number or wrong type of arguments and other such errors before we actually tried to use our procedures. And we'll see how static analysis can help us do that. What does it mean to avoid wasted work? Well, suppose we evaluate our standard definition of factorial, as shown here. Now, suppose we are applying factorial to some argument, which means we are evaluating the application of the procedure to an argument. Think about what happens inside of eval. First, eval must run through its case analysis to determine that this expression is an application. It must then run through its case analysis again to decide that fact is a symbol and to look up its binding. Similarly, with looking up the value of the argument. Then it must run through its case analysis yet another time to determine that the body is an if expression, and then it must evaluate the predicate. This means that we have to run through the case analysis of eval, that big cond clause, four times in order to get to this stage. But now the evaluation of the predicate is false, so this reduces to a multiplication of n by a recursive call to fact. The problem is that now the evaluator runs through exactly the same set of case analysis four times, even though we know that the body is an if. So we repeat all of that work just to get back to the same point. Wouldn't it be nice if we could avoid this? That is, if we could take advantage of the fact that in passing through the code once, we've already deduced a lot of information about the procedure and its structure. We're going to do that by building a variant of the evaluator that statically analyzes expressions before evaluation. So here's a summary of the key points of this part of the lecture. Here's the strategy that we're going to follow as we sketch the design for a new evaluator. Our goal is to separate static analysis from evaluation, so we want to describe an analyze stage in which an expression is converted into a new form. That form at execution stage will be coupled with an environment to complete the rules of evaluation. To do this, we're going to need to specify what the analyze stage should produce. We are going to have it produce an execution procedure. That is, the analysis is going to convert the expression into a procedure that takes a single argument, an environment. When this procedure is applied to an environment, it will use the bindings of symbols in that environment to complete the evaluation of the expression. 
As a consequence, our new evaluator will first use analyze to convert an expression just based on its structure into this execution procedure, which can then be applied to the environment. This will make more sense if we look at some examples of analyzing different kinds of expressions. So let's do that. A simple place to start would be with an expression that is just a variable. We would like our analysis stage to recognize this as a variable and create a procedure that will actually look up the value of the variable in an environment when asked to. Thus, the output of the analysis stage should be a procedure of one argument, an environment, whose body will be the actual lookup process. Note that we want this to hold for any variable, so our procedure's body should simply look up a name, where the environment part of the procedure contains the specific binding of the name, in this case, pi. If we were then to apply this procedure to some environment, the actual evaluation would first look up the binding for name, just pi, and then it would look up the binding for that specific variable name in the environment. Note as a consequence that we have two separate structures being used here. The analyze stage will create a procedure whose environment contains bindings for the parts of the expression. At evaluation time, we will provide a data structure for the specific values of symbols that will be used to complete the evaluation. So how do we capture this? Well, our analyze procedure will dispatch on type, just as our evaluator did. In the case of an expression that is a variable, we will return a procedure whose body captures the idea of looking up the value of a variable. Notice that the black part of this expression gets evaluated at the analysis stage. That is, the procedure will be built with a pointer to an environment that contains the binding for EXP. The blue part will be evaluated at evaluation time when this procedure is applied to an environment, in which case the binding for X will be looked up in the provided environment. So let's see if you're getting this idea. How would you implement the analysis of an expression that is just a number? When you're ready, go to the next slide. Right. A number's value is just itself, so we simply return a procedure of one argument whose body just returns the value of the expression. So here's a summary of this part of the lecture. Now let's look at a more complex expression. Suppose we want to analyze an if expression, such as the one that comes from the body of fact. At the analysis stage, we want to take each of the parts of the if and recursively do our analysis. Each of these stages should then produce an execution procedure. For example, the second one will just give us the procedure we saw in the last example for dealing with numbers. Note that this analysis will help us save the extra work that motivated all of this, as we can analyze each piece statically once and produce a procedure that will do the actual evaluation given an environment. And in the case of factorial, this environment will simply contain different bindings for the variable n. At the execution stage, we will simply complete the evaluation of the predicate expression and based on its value, either complete the evaluation of the consequence or the alternative. So here's the code to do this. The analysis stage will do the actual analysis of the sub-expressions and glue these together into a procedure for use at execution time. Only at that time will the execution procedures be applied to determine which of the consequence and alternative is to be used. A visualization of this is shown here. When Analyze gets an if expression, it produces an execution procedure whose environment contains pointers to the procedures associated with execution of each of the sub-expressions. Those procedures come from the recursive application of Analyze, such as the one shown for the sub-expression that's just a number. So what about things like definitions? How would you complete the analysis of an expression like this? When you think you have the answer, go to the next slide. Well, the variable part we don't want to analyze, since it is just a symbol to be bound at execution time. We do analyze the value to be associated with the variable, then glue this together into an execution procedure so that at evaluation time, that value is actually computed and then bound to the symbol. So here's a summary of this part of the lecture. There are a few other changes we need to make to our evaluator to allow for static analysis. One deals with how we implement lambda. Notice that in our new approach, the body stored within a double bubble is now an execution procedure. That is, something that needs to be applied to an environment at execution time. Thus, in the original eval, our make procedure method would glue together a list of variables, an expression to be evaluated when we applied the procedure, and an environment that captured the meanings of the symbols in the expression. Here, we need our make procedure to use an execution procedure in place of the expression, since that is what will be applied when we go to evaluate the body of a procedure. Thus, when we analyze a lambda expression, we will analyze the body to get the appropriate execution procedure, whose application will complete the body's evaluation, and we glue it together with the variable names and the environment. 
Of course, if our lambda objects are different, then application of a lambda will also have to be a bit different. Previously, an application would simply have resulted in the evaluation of the body with respect to an extended environment. Now, it results in applying the execution procedure that corresponds to the body to the execution environment. And hence, the analysis of an application, that is something like fact three, will require that we analyze each of the sub-expressions, just as we would have evaluated each of the sub-expressions in the normal evaluator, then we create an execution procedure that at evaluation time applies the body to the values of the arguments. While there are additional details in the textbook about the analyze evaluator, this completes the sketch of the key changes. The main issue to note is how we can separate the static analysis of the code from the actual determining of its meaning. This allows us to avoid repeating that analysis at each iteration through a loop, leading to much more efficient code. Now, let's go back to thinking about evaluation in very abstract terms. We can ask the question, what is a val really? And here's one way of thinking about it. Imagine that you're a circuit designer and you want to automate the process of designing circuits. One can envision taking a circuit diagram and somehow encoding it electronically with signals to represent the components and their connections. Now, you want to build a circuit that takes as input a signal representing the electronic version of one of those circuit diagrams and have this general circuit reconfigure itself so that it behaves exactly like the circuit described in the diagram. This general circuit would be extremely useful since it would allow us to build just that general circuit and then have it behave like any other one. The key question is, how do you build such a circuit? Well, that's a tough one to answer. So instead, suppose that you are describing a circuit using the language of procedures, that is, as a program. The same question holds. Can we build a program that takes a description of any other program as input and reconfigures itself to behave like the described program? As should re you should realize, the answer is clearly yes. That's exactly what a VAL is doing. We say that a VAL is an example of a universal machine. That is, it can behave like any other machine whose process can be described using the language of description, namely as a procedure. This is an incredibly powerful idea since it says one can describe the process of evaluation for any kind of process. This idea wasn't always that obvious, as is shown by this quote. But it's a very powerful idea, and we want to briefly explore how this idea of a universal machine affects our understanding of computation in general. Why do we say a VAL is a universal machine? We've argued that it describes the process of evaluation for any legal expression in our language, and since procedures are our way of capturing processes, this means it describes the evaluation of any process. One consequence of that is that since a VAL itself is a process, a VAL can simulate itself. Indeed, that was our example of our metacircular M eval, in which we used schemes evaluator to describe the process of evaluation. This meant that we could then explore variations on evaluation, such as lazy evaluation, by simply changing the description of the evaluation. A second consequence is that eval can simulate an evaluator for any language. So we could write an evaluator for C or C++ or Fortran in scheme just by describing the process of evaluation in our language for such description. Indeed, that is true for any language. That is, we can describe the process of evaluation of one language in any other language. This implies that anything we can compute in one language, we can also compute in any other language. And that leads to a general notion of computability. Things computable in one language are computable in any other. Hence the idea of a universal machine. This insight of a universal machine and the notion of computability is essentially due to one man, Alan Turing, an English mathematician who in many ways is the father of computer science. Here is a very brief sketch of Turing's idea. As a student, Turing was trying to address a famous mathematical problem posed by David Hilbert. It asked whether there was a fixed, definite process by which one could answer any mathematical question. The motivation came from considering the problem of proving theorems in geometry. One could imagine a process in which one first considered all proofs that followed in one step from a fixed set of axioms, then in two steps, and so on. Turing was, Turing was trying to answer this problem, and he did so by interpreting the notion of process very literally. He constructed a simple kind of machine, showed how you could encode other processes in terms of this machine, and basically wrote the first eval. He then used this Turing machine, as it is now called, to answer a fundamental question in computation. Specifically, are there problems that cannot be solved by computational process? If there is a problem that a universal machine cannot solve, then no machine can solve it, and hence there is no effective process for this problem. To answer this question, Turing used the following argument. 
His version, of course, was much more intricate, but the basic idea is the same. First, make a list of all possible programs that take a single input. Arbitrarily number them and think of them as the rows of a big matrix. Second, encode their possible inputs as integers using some mechanism. And let those inputs form the columns of this matrix. Now, write down the response of each machine to each input as an integer, as an error, or indicate if the machine loops forever for this input. Of course, one wouldn't actually write out all of these values for this matrix, but the argument is that one could. Now, construct a new program whose output on input n is whatever the nth machine outputs for that input, plus 1, if the machine actually provides an answer. Otherwise, return 0. Here's the problem. That function f can't possibly be one of the programs in our list, since its output differs from every program in the list, by the way we've constructed it. But we just described a process for computing f, and we said that we had a list of all possible programs. So we have a contradiction. We have described a program that is not in the set of possible programs. So where's the flaw? The answer is in our assumption that we'll be, we would be able to determine if any machine would always halt with an answer. This represents a very fundamental limitation on computation. It says that there are some problems for which it is not possible to determine an answer in all cases. In particular, one cannot predetermine that a machine or program will always halt with an answer as opposed to looping forever. This is the first major result in computability that indicates limits to what can be computed. Turing's insight is important, both for showing how things that can be computed can be computed in any language, but also that there are things that cannot be computed. Hence, the idea of a universal machine helps us capture the notion of what is computable and forms the basis for establishing the equivalence of programming languages both in terms of computability and things that are not computable.